Good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you to another exciting Friends Talk. My name is Reinhold Gebert, and I'm a friend of the Institute. Um, in fact, I'm a rare breed of friend because I've been on the other side. I was a theoretical physicist and member in the School of Natural Science 14 years ago. I was very excited and deeply moved when Pamela asked me whether I'd like to announce today's speaker, Edward Witten. Ed is the reason I came to America, and he's also one of the key reasons why my wife and I are so passionate about the Friends and the Institute. I will never forget the day I received the invitation letter from Ed, the undisputed Lord of the Strings, to come, <laughs> to, come to the Institute. To use a comparison, it's as if the late Michael Jackson, the king of pop, had invited me to join him for a concert. <laughs> I cannot possibly list all of Ed's accomplishments and prizes. However, it's particularly noteworthy that he's the only physicist who's been awarded the Fields Medal, which is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in mathematics. Ed is also the most cited physicist living today. With more than 350 published scientific papers, he has established mathematical physics as a subject in its own right. Today, Ed will talk to us about knots and quantum theory. While it's obvious to me that tangled strings can form knots, I'm curious to hear what this has to do with quantum theory. So, Ed, please twist our brains. <laughs> Um, well, thanks. thanks to the friends for inviting me, and thanks very much, Reinhardt, for the kind introduction. So actually, the talk I'm going to give today is a little bit different from any I've given in the past. I decided that it wouldn't be that exciting for me to give an overview of anything, since I've done it before. So instead, I was going to give a talk in which I actually would try to explain to you what I've been working on in the last year. But the trouble is that I can't quite do that. I'll really spend most of the time trying to orient you about the background. And then we'll just say a few words about what I've been doing. Now, first of all, a knot is more or less what you think it is. It's a possibly tangled loop in ordinary space. So that's an example of a knot. The only thing is that this is kind of a useless knot because it doesn't tie anything to anything. Usually, we think of knots as having a reason. For example, well, you're tying something together, possibly. But from a mathematical point of view, that's an excess baggage. So the essence of a knot is a loop in three-dimensional space, a loop such as the one I've drawn here. So it's confusing to look at, and that's one of the basic truths about knots. Knots are perplexing to try to comprehend, even though in principle they seem like simple things in concept. So the example probably reminds us of something we know from everyday life, which is that well, it's very easy to generate a, a messy knot. And once you've done so, it can be pretty hard to understand what you've got. So in particular, if you've got a knot, it can be pretty hard to know if it can be untangled. And I think it's even harder if you're given two different tangles to decide whether they're equivalent. So uh, we kind of feel, given a messy piece of string, especially if we have some reason to know that from the way it was made that it can be undone, that we can undo it. But if you're given two pictures like this, and he has to decide if they're equivalent, that's really messy. Now, this might not sound like a question in math, if your concept of math is that it has to do with adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. But in fact, there's a lot more to math. And in the 20th century, mathematicians developed a rather deep theory of knots. Knots turned out to be rather deep mathematical objects. And mathematical knot theory gave surprisingly, surprising ways to answer questions, like whether a given knot can be untangled or whether two different tangles are actually equivalent. OK, so that's what mathematicians did. And I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a bit. But before going farther, I'd like to address the question of why I'm interested as a physicist. Now, knots are things that can exist in three-dimensional space. But personally, I'm only interested in them because of something surprising that emerged in the last three decades. Much of the theory of knots 
is best understood in the framework of 20th and 21st century developments in quantum physics. In other words, what I care about personally are not the knots per se, but their relations to quantum physics. Now, okay, I was actually asked while we were chatting before the <coughs> seminar uh, when knot theory got started. And, okay, people wrote about knots in the 19th century. But uh, by 1923, James Alexander defines an invariant of knots that mathematicians still study today. And an important refinement was made later by our former colleague here at the Institute, John Conway. But the story, as I'll tell it, begins with something called the Jones polynomial, which was discovered by von Jones in 1983. So he discovered a new property of knots called the Jones polynomial. It's led to a lot of new discoveries continuing to the present day. So it's very modern, close to the frontier of contemporary mathematics, but it's also surprisingly elementary in the basic concept. You could go into a high school class, at least a high school class of kids who like math, and explain what the Jones polynomial is without compromising very much. There are not many things at the frontiers of modern mathematics where one would say that. For instance, nobody would claim that you could explain Andrew Wells' proof of Fermat's last theorem to high school students. <laughs> not even close, not even the concepts that he used or the tools or techniques. It's layer upon layer. Fem the proof of Fermat's last theorem is many layers removed from what you could explain to high school students. But the Jones polynomial, even though it is near the frontiers of modern mathematics, is also so elementary that you ca actually can explain it to high school students. So what Jones discovered basically was a way to compute a number for any knot. So we'll call an R knot k, and we'll write j sub k for the number Jones calculates for this knot. So there's going to be a definite rule to calculate jk. So no matter how messy the knot might be, such as the one I showed you a picture of a little while ago, you can calculate the number jk attached to that knot if you're patient enough. And what Jones discovered is that if this magic number jk is not equal to 1, the knot k can never be untangled. And moreover, if two different knots have different numbers, then they're not equivalent to each other. You can't bend and stretch one into the other without cutting the strands. Now, if we take this knot here, you could think about trying to uh, unravel it. And you probably won't make much progress. But how could you prove that that particular messy tangle, tangled loop of string cannot be unknotted, cannot be turned into a, um, a simple circle that isn't tangled up. Well, Jones gave a way to answer a question like that. Calculate this number, j, attached to the knot. And if it isn't 1, it means the knot can't be untied. And more generally, if two knots have different numbers, then they're not equivalent to each other. You can't uh, transform one into the other without cutting and tearing the string. So finding the method by which Jones cal calculates j sub k was clever. But once it was discovered, in principle, you can use it without any cleverness. There's just a set of instructions that you're supposed to follow, and you use them to calculate j k. So how do we calculate j k? Well, one important fact, one important rule is that it's 1 in the case of the unknot, which I probably should have drawn before. Untangling a knot means moving around the strings so as to transform it into the unknot without breaking or tearing anything. For all the other knots, we have to play a little game. So to play the game, we pick three favorite numbers, for example, 2, 3, and 5. But any numbers will do. And we're going to do something that might seem to make life more complicated. Instead of a single knot k, we're going to consider three knots, k, k prime, and k double prime. 
And if the three knots that we pick are related in a certain way, there's going to be a relationship, what mathematicians call an identity. The twice j of one knot plus three times j of the second knot plus five times j of the third knot is going to be zero. Remember, there's nothing special about the numbers two, three, and five. We just pick them. Joan says you can pick your favorite numbers, in fact. This identity is so powerful that it will enable us to calculate the j's. So this identity isn't going to be true for every three set of knots. I have to tell you how the three knots should be related to make the identity true. To explain that, I've drawn something which isn't a knot. It's not a knot because something is missing. So out here, we've drawn a bit of a knot. But the blue dotted line, inside the blue dotted line, I've left a gap represented by the question mark. To make a knot out of this thing, uh, we would have to, there are four strands that end on the blue dotted line. And to complete the picture, we need to somehow connect those strands. By the way, if we connect them, what we arrive at might be either connected or not connected. Um, although I use the term not, I, uh, we're not going to worry about whether it's actually a single piece of string or more than one piece of string. More than one piece of string would make what mathematicians call a link. So to explain what k, k prime, and k double prime are going to be, I'll give you three different ways to fill in what's missing here so as to make a knot. We pick three different ways. If you glue any one of these three little pictures in here, you'd complete the picture and make a knot. So that gives you k, k prime, and k double prime. <coughs> and then we declare that the numbers, unfortunately I wrote here functions. I was trying to get rid of such mathematical terminology. So it should say the numbers jk, jk prime, and jk double prime associated to these knots should obey this relation 2 times j of the first knot plus 3 times j of the second knot plus 5 times j of the third knot should be, should be 0. So that's a relationship that Jones's knot numbers obey. And you see, any time the two strands crossed each other, we can draw a circle around it and call that k. And then we would make k prime and k double prime by replacing the picture inside the circle. So this is an operation that we can do whenever we look at our knot and we see two strands that look like they're on top of each other. So if we've got a picture like this, so where one strand crosses another gives what knot theorists call a crossing. So in this picture, you see roughly a dozen crossings. One, two, three, four, five, and so on. It looks like it's more than a dozen. We could draw a little circle around any crossing. And then we could add in the two other pictures. So we'd get a relation that two times the j number of this knot plus three times the j number of some other knot, and so on, five times the j number of the third knot, would add up to zero. So there are a lot of different ways to apply the rule to a, a given knot such as this one. It's not very hard to see that um, if you uh, are given this rule, you can actually calculate j for any knot. So that's definitely what we would prove to our audience, our hypothetical audience of high school students interested in math. So. Um, if you were faced with the problem of untangling this knot, you might notice, well, if I could pass this strand through that one, it would be easier. So the identity tells us passing through this strand through this one is like replacing k by k double prime. If we didn't have to worry about the third knot, it would tell us that one j number is just minus 5 halves times the other. But the third term in the identity is simple in a different way. 